We're going to launch the TED Talk now, and I'll see you in about 20 minutes. Haley, if you'd launch it, thank you. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Should launch any minute. Here we go. I'm a storyteller, and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <coughs> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> Now, this despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> And for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books, by their very nature, had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now, things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available, and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laye, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized, now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor, my mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. 
She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago, in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in. And other countries. So after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West, a tradition of sub-Saharan Africa as a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet <coughs> Rudyard Kipling, are half devil, half child. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have, throughout her life, seen and heard different versions of this single story. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places, but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle-class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that I, too, am just as guilty on the question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US. The political climate in the US at the time was tense, and there were debates going on about immigration. And as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. 
I had bought into the single story of Mexicans, and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. So that is how to create a single story. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is nkale. It's a noun that loosely translates to to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of nkale. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Murid Baghouti writes that if you want to dispossess a people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. Start the story with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British, and you have an entirely different story. Start the story with the failure of the African state, and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. I recently spoke at a university where a student told me that it was such a shame that Nigerian men were, were <clears throat> physical abusers like the father character in my novel. I told him that I had just read a novel called American Psycho. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that it was such a shame that young Americans were serial murderers. <laughs> now, 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 obviously I said this in a fit of mild irritation, but <laughs> it would never have occurred to me to think that just because I had read a novel in which a character was a serial killer, that he was somehow representative of all Americans. And now this is not because I'm a better person than that student, but because of America's cultural and economic power, I had many stories of America. I had read Thailand, Updike, and Steinbeck, and Gateskill. I did not have a single story of America. When I learned some years ago that writers were expected to have had really unhappy childhoods to be successful, I began to think about how I could invent horrible things my parents had done to me. <laughs> But the truth is that I had a very happy childhood, full of laughter and love in a very close-knit family. But I also had grandfathers who died in refugee camps. My cousin, Polly, died because he could not get adequate health care. One of my closest friends, Okoloma, died in a plane crash because our fire trucks did not have water. I grew up under repressive military governments that devalued education so that sometimes my parents were not paid their salaries. And so as a child, I saw jam disappear from the breakfast table. Then margarine disappeared. Then bread became too expensive. Then milk became rationed. And most of all, a kind of normalized political fear invaded our lives. All of these stories make me who I am. But to insist on only these negative stories is to flatten my experience and to overlook the many other stories that formed me. The single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Of course, Africa is a continent full of catastrophes, the immense ones such as the horrific rapes in Congo and depressing ones such as the fact that 5,000 people apply for one job vacancy in Nigeria. But there are other stories that are not about catastrophe, and it is very important, it is just as important to talk about them. I've always felt that it is impossible to engage properly with a place or a person without engaging with all of the stories of that place and that person. The consequence of the single story is this, it robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. So what if before my Mexican trip, I had followed the immigration debate from both sides, the US and the Mexican? What if my mother had told us that Fide's family was poor 
and hardworking. What if we had an African television network that broadcast diverse African stories all over the world, what the Nigerian writer Chino Achebe calls a balance of stories? What if my roommate knew about my Nigerian publisher, Mukta Bakari, a remarkable man who left his job in a bank to follow his dream and start a publishing house? Now, the conventional wisdom was that Nigerians don't read literature. He disagreed. He felt that people who could read would read if you made literature affordable and available to them. Shortly after he published my first novel, I went to a TV station in Lagos to do an interview. And a woman who walked there as a messenger came up to me and said, I really liked your novel. I didn't like the ending. Now you must write a sequel, and this is what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> and she went on to tell me what to write in the sequel. Now, I was not only charmed, I was very moved. Here was a woman, part of the ordinary masses of Nigerians who are not supposed to be readers. She had not only read the book, but she had taken ownership of it and felt justified in telling me what to write in the sequel. Now, what if my roommate knew about my friend, Fumi Yonda, a fearless woman who hosts a TV show in Lagos and is determined to tell the stories that we prefer to forget? What if my roommate knew about the heart procedure that was performed in the Lagos hospital last week? What if my roommate knew about contemporary Nigerian music? Talented people singing in English and Pidgin and Igbo and Yoruba and Ijo, mixing influences from Jay-Z to Fela to Bob Marley to their grandfathers. What if my roommate knew about the female lawyer who recently went to court in Nigeria to challenge a ridiculous law that required women to get their husband's consent before renewing their passports? What if my roommate knew about Nollywood, full of innovative people making films despite great technical odds, films so popular that they really are the best example of Nigerians consuming what they produce? What if my roommate knew about my wonderfully ambitious hair braider who has just started her own business selling hair extensions? Or about the millions of other Nigerians who start businesses and sometimes fail, but continue to nurse ambition? Every time I am home, I am confronted with the usual sources of irritation for most Nigerians, our failed infrastructure, our failed government, but also by the incredible resilience of people who thrive despite the government rather than because of it. I teach writing workshops in Lagos every summer, and it is amazing to me how many people apply, how many people are eager to write, to tell stories. My Nigerian publisher and I have just started a nonprofit called Farafina Trust, and we have big dreams of building libraries and refurbishing libraries that already exist and providing books for state schools that don't have anything in their libraries, and also of organizing lots and lots of workshops on reading and writing for all the people who are eager to tell our many stories. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. The American writer Alice Walker wrote this about um, her southern relatives who had moved to the north, and she introduced them to a book about the southern life that they had left behind. They sat around reading the book themselves, listening to me read the book, and the kind of paradise was regained. I would like to end with this thought, that when we reject the single story, when we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. Inspiring? I find so. And even in preparation of this talk, I've watched it about six times this week and still find there's things to learn and uh, good feelings to be had. 
Um, before I start, I, I understand a few people had a few problems. So I just want to reiterate that there's the Q&A function. The chat function is disabled, but the Q&A function is available. And you can send notes to uh, Haley Ma or Bonnie Sung if you're having technical problems. Otherwise, you can send questions or comments uh, to me, and I will try to uh, both do my work here and share my, uh, uh, my presentation and watch for questions and comments. I'm going to just wait a minute or two because uh, I think some people um, launched the, the TED Talk in their own server um, or their own browser, so we might give them a second or two to rejoin the conversation. This is great already, lots of comments coming in. Super, 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 super. Just another minute and uh, I did say 11.25, but I think if a few people uh, just need to just have a minute. So her TED talk has been viewed by over 20 million people the most viewed of all times. Also, if you're a fan of Chimamanda Adichie, HBO Max has announced her novel, Americana, will be adopted into a 12 episode TV series. Too bad we didn't have this time when we binge watch on, <laughs> on our, uh, our, our television. So now the task of connecting her ideas and the need for multiple stories and the need for us all to continually reflect on the stories we are exposed to. You will see these artworks today on a screen. Needless to say, the images are poor substitutes for seeing the real thing. We hope that we soon can welcome you back at MOA where these works and other things can inspire you. Let me introduce the artists and the knowledge holders whose work and ideas we'll be thinking about what I call framing stories. First, Susan Point from Musqueam. Next, we'll look at the work of John Marsden, Stonemus, from the Vancouver Island region between Ladysmith and Chimenez. Then, Michael Nicol Yagalanis from Haida Gwaii, an archipelago on the northeast coast of British Columbia. Then we have Tracy Williams, she's Squamish. She lives on the North, North Shore in the Van, greater Vancouver region. We have Marianne Nicholson and Mike Willey, both Kwakwakiwak. It's the central coast of Vancouver Island and the central coast of the mainland and the inlets and the islands in between. Then we have Bill Reed, who's Haida. And we'll wrap up with Tanya Willard, Swetwetnik, which is around the Nanaimo in the central interior, not Nanaimo, uh, Kamloops area and Chase area of the central interior. Okay, let's begin. We start with this work by Susan Point from Musqueam called Salish Footprint, created in 2010. Living and working in the lower mainland of BC, I begin with the necessity of including Musqueam history and stories in our lives, acknowledging how it enriches our own knowledge and understanding of where we are and who has lived here for over 9,000 years. A quote from Susan Point, Coast Salish art has forever been a way to honor and remember significant details on our social lives. My hope is that my children remember to tell not only our cultural accounts, but also their own stories. She writes that this work is written into the earth as a visual expression of the link between the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people and the site of the Museum of Anthropology. It emphasizes Musqueam's connections to these lands, to the waters, to the weaving traditions and to our ancestors storytelling. She gives us lots to think about. Susan Point, is an internationally renowned Musqueam artist with work in public and private collections around the world. There are many places in the Vancouver area where you can see her public art, Stanley Park being one. The inspiration for her artworks are the stories of her ancestors. 
In this work, she uses non-traditional materials and techniques. It is inlaid stone. The work is asymmetrically arranged to reinforce the ideas that no imprint or story are exactly the same. This resonates with Adichie's statements that many stories matter. You move to a detail. <clears throat> when I'm doing a tour, I often ask people, what do they see when they look at this work? Many, focuses on, many focus on the designs, the color, the layout. They see various fish and birds. Susan Point has used the form of the whorls on our fingers and foot, foots as footprints and fingerprints to evoke a larger Salish footprint. Then I ask them to step back and they can see the entrance to the museum. And you step back again and it often dawns on visitors that they are actually seeing Musqueam. The story gets bigger as you include more. As you enter the museum and as we enter this presentation, it's the beginning of the offering of multiple stories, not simple stereotypes. Both, our, both visitors and ourselves leave our footprints, leave our uh, experiences, adding layers and layers to them. We'll move on. <laughs> I'm just looking at some of the comments. Uh, we have somebody from uh, New Zealand joining us. Welcome from afar. And someone who lives in the Mexican community here in Vancouver. And, I'll, I'll, I'll return to her some of her comments. Next, we have this work by John Marsden called To Share History. I cannot pronounce the Halkamalum, so I'm not going to try. In some of the words I've been learning, but not this one. The artist John Marsden states, if you don't take time to really try and understand people, take the time to learn about their culture, then you won't get to see a lot of things in this world. Like Adaichi, John Marsden is speaking about the importance of learning different histories, of seeking meaningful ways to understand others. <clears throat> Excuse me. John Marsden is a contemporary Stenemos artist. Again, he, that's in the area on Vancouver Island, um, south of Nanaimo, that's inclusive of Ladysmith and Shamanus and other uh, areas. Some background for this piece. John Marsden traveled to the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea to learn and work with Iatmul master carver Teddy Balangu, who belongs to the Simal clan. John Marsden carved this to share history, to represent the relationship that was built during these visits. Teddy Balangu also visited here at Moa and John in his home community on Vancouver Island. There's a great video documentary called <clears throat> Uh, crocodile and killer, no, it's killer whale and crocodile, pardon me. And it's a great documentary of this exchange of these artists. And there's a very sweet scene in it where you see Teddy Balangu fishing on a river with, uh, with John Marston and it snows. That's Teddy's first experience of snow. I encourage you to see it. This piece connects two artists, two histories and multiple stories. It reflects both Coast Salish territory and Sepik River territory in Papua New Guinea. It is carved from cedar and woods more common to Papua New Guinea, of walnut, rosewood, and ebony. On the base, there are two pairs of carved figures, the crocodile and the killer whale. The crocodile representing Teddy Balangu and the killer whale representing John Marsden. The carved vertical panel has two sides, both with carved images of the faces of the sun and the moon. John Marsden goes on to say that this represented, is representative of two cultures, worlds apart, but much the same in so many ways. We'll move to a detail. <clears throat> I don't think it's a detail, but I'll speak to it. In this detail, you can see one face. The sun and the moon are reversed on either side. What we can't see in this picture is the face behind the sun and the moons. The face within a face is very hard to see because it represents the importance of truly coming to understand someone 
That takes time and effort. You will need to visit MOA and have a really good look in order to have these faces reveal themselves. In many ways, the artist is encouraging us to keep looking, to keep seeking more stories. The more stories we listen to, our perspectives expand and we avoid, avoid what Idichi warns as the problem of how one story can become the only story. We'll move on to the next slide. A stack of plywood trays built to contain fragments of everyone's cultures. This is by Michael Nicol Yagalanis and is written on this piece called Bone Box, which was um, created in 2007. The Bone Box comprises 12 painted panes that form a screen resembling the front of the um, beautiful carved chest, the bent wood boxes from the Northwest Coast, particularly Haida. But Nichols' box is only a facade and the painted panels are actually empty storage trays reclaimed by Nickel from archeological collection storage system discarded by MOA. You can see various episodes within the frames that take the form of that take a form similar to graphic novels, like chapters of a larger story. What you can't see in this image is that it opens. And when opened, you see part of the museum's Northwest Coast collection beyond. Here, the artist is telling us that the museum's collections are always fragments, always only partial stories, pushing visitors and viewers alike to think about the objects and belongings of, culture, of other cultures in museums and the role of institutions like MOA in collecting and displaying these fragments. Michael Nicol Yagalanis was born into the Yagulanis Raven clan and raised in Delcata, Haida Gwaii. He is from a lineage of iconic artists. He has heard of, have you, have you ever heard of Haida Manga? A visual practice coined by this artist referring to his combining of Japanese manga and Haida visual art. Michael Nicol Yagalanis asks us to consider new forms of Haida art, challenging stereotypes of what Haida art is and asking an even more important question, who gets to decide? I'm gonna to move to a detail of this work. How's it working? Is everybody getting the slides as they should? I'll just double check that there's no problems. Great. There are so many different stories that this work evokes. As Chimbamanda Adachi says, many stories matter. Here's one detail. It is of a painting of the mountains of the North Shore of the Vancouver area. These mountains have two names, one ancient, they are called the Twin Sisters by the Squamish, and more recently called the Lions, as if the mountain peaks are sitting lions. The twin sisters are mountain peaks that are storied markers of a peace treaty between the Squamish and the Haida. They involve a transformation, a marriage, and the end to a conflict. But this story and its relationship to place and culture has been overwritten by the renaming of them as the lions. This is both a literal and metaphoric reminder of how history can too easily be replaced or erased through renaming and through the telling of only one story. I wonder how many people in the Vancouver area know the ancient names of these peaks. This is just one of the stories that Michael Nicol Yagalanis is asking us to consider in this really complex and beautiful work. I'll just reiterate that these slides are beautiful and they're in a high resolution, but they're not a replacement for seeing the real work. I'll move to the next slide. Tracy Williams is a Squamish artist, a basket maker. Tracy Williams says, all good things come from the cedar tree, our long hosas, canoes, clothing, baskets, and spiritual cleansing. My grandmother, Eva Mae Nahani, knew these things and was taught by her grandmother. Throughout her life, she had made baskets to help support her family of 10 children. It is with great pride that I continue the traditions of my grandmother. Here, I wanna reinforce the connections between 20th century basket makers. 
their baskets and the next generation. Tracy Williams learned from her grandmother, the grandmother passing down the knowledge of the land, how to harvest materials and how to transform them into beautiful functional baskets. Tracy Williams is equal parts scientist, artist, hunter, maker. She's been called a traditional technologist, meaning she has learned to do things the old ways, tanning hides, weaving baskets, learning from the land. She has tanned salmon skin and sewn them into uh, shoes. She's remarkable. She's the woman you wanna know if you have to live off the land. She is also a school counselor. Intergenerational teachings and stories are important to her as they are to all of us. The potlatch ban, Indian residential school, imposed political systems all work to marginalize Indian, indigenous women and men. Colonialism and the Canadian government's attempt at genocide has impacted so many communities. By looking at the beauty of what was and continues to be, to add to that story, you make space for resiliency and creativity, not just stories of trauma. Weavings were and continue to be in use in the community for sale and trade. Tracy's grandmother, even May Nahani, made some of the baskets in Moa's collection. They were sold or traded during the 1950s when times were economically hard. I'll move to a detail, show a couple of uh, uh, blank uh, baskets up close. These are so beautiful. <laughs> They're cedar slap woven baskets with dye designs embarcated, which means um, woven over the top using dyed cherry bark. The patterns and the designs are connected to weavers and families. Those in the know recognize weavers work by the patterns and the patterns are handed down as well. When doing a tour of this area in the multiversity galleries at MOA that house hundreds of beautiful baskets, I love to connect contemporary baskets such as these with the 1,000 to 4,500 year old basketry fragments that are in the same case. Terry Point from Musqueam has shared that the knots of some of the ancient fishing net fragments that are 4,500 years old are the same knots used today on monofilament fishing nets, proving that the exchange of intergenerational knowledge continues. When something works, why change it? There are many collections of these baskets on the, in the Vancouver area because the women move from community to community to sell and trade them during these economic hard times. It's one of the ways MOA has acquired many of its baskets from these family collections. We'll move on. And I'm just going to take a break. So if there are some questions or now I'll read in a bit more detail, the larger question from our friend, Ari. It says, uh, living in a Mexican community here in Vancouver have felt underrepresented so many times. Um, one of the places that keeps my faith honestly seeking culture is the museum and MOA is not an exception. In your opinion, what would, it, what would be a better way to approach the MOA in order to suggest activities or ideas for minorities looking for a niche to represent themselves? Well, great question, Ari, and a good person to pose it to as I'm the curator of education and I'm the head of uh, programs and engagement at MOA. Well, one thing and I would encourage everyone who's online with us is to reach out. Um, my name and uh, contacts are available on the MOA website. I'd love to hear from people. and pitch ideas. Sometimes that's the best place they come from, is communities coming forward saying, how about this? For example, a few years ago, we did a, a major celebration of Day of the Dead, a, a very important uh, celebration in Mexico. And the idea came from a community member. And we ended up having uh, ofrendas and hot chocolate and cake and a piñata. It was a great day. So I guess my note to you, Ari, is reach out. Who knows? We can't do everything, but we can do many things. 
Thanks for that. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> That was just instead of a question it was more of a shout out to one of the participants so i'm going to shift here and feel free to keep asking questions if you have any or comments they don't need to be questions i'm going to shift here from the need to share multiple stories um, to the idea that not all stories are ours to share marianne nicholson states I created this piece to recognize that the rights and privileges that the masks embodied are still active and integral to the Muskimu Zawadena people. Marianne Nicholson is Muskimu Zawadena. She is an artist and a Kwakwakiwak cultural researcher and historian, as well as an advocate for indigenous land rights. In this work, even though I am last, I still count, two is, a, is two mixed media photo-based panels. The panel on the left includes painted depictions of four wolves, while the inner photographic image is of Nicholson's aunts and uncles as children. The larger image is of old growth forest from Kinkim Inlet, where Nicholson is from. The panel on the right includes four painted ravens on the outer borders, while the inner photographic image is of the artist's mother and her younger sister. The larger image below is of the water and the lands around Guilford Island one of the island, Kwakwakiwak Island communities between Vancouver Island and the mainland. The title references the bumblebee dance where one child is left behind, but then found. One of the bands of photographic images in this work are contemporary photographs of young children doing this dance in the big house, a ceremonial house in Kinkum Inlet. I'll move to the next slide. I'm just going to have a quick, I see a couple of images. Um, a couple of posts, but nothing that seems need attention right now. The panels, the, the panels that we just saw in the installation at the museum's multiversity galleries are actually surrounded by bumblebee masks. You can see in the detail, not perfectly, but you get the context. The bumblebee masks were owned by Marianne Nicholson's grandfather and sold to Moa. However, the traditions, cultural practices and stories that are part of the dance still belonged and have never left the family. New masks can be created. What was not sold nor could be sold are the rights to the mask and its dances. In this case, it stays with the Muskimu Zawadena people. The artist is helping us understand that the knowledge Stories, dances, rights, and privileges are not tangible objects, rather cultural property that is still owned, cared for, and demonstrated in potlatches and other cultural events, according to protocols determined by the community. This is a twist on Adaichi's idea of the danger of a single story. It declares that not all knowledge, not all stories, are for everyone to own. Here, the owners get to determine when, and how they are shared. Move to the next slide. And you see a detail of something that you would also see on the platform in the installation in the Multiversity Galleries at MOA. Kwakwakiwak Chief Michael Willie shares, in our Kwakwala language, there is a word, kwikwatloa. My apologies to all Kwakwala speakers, which means things that are hidden. Traditionally, our wolf headdresses, whistles, and other objects of nawala, or supernatural power, were put away when not being shown in ceremony. He continues, for some of our people, to have these things on display for the public is very disturbing. I thought that one thing we might do, be able to do, is to wrap some of the masks on display. This is so that the public can understand that not everyone is meant to see these things. Mike Willie is asserting that communities have rights over their stories and their cultural practices. Adichie's statements show people as one thing and one thing over, 
one thing only over and over again, and that is what they become, seems relevant here. For generations, the idea of indigenous, that Indigenous cultures were disappearing became the dominant story. There were too few stories of the impact of oppressive legislations on communities and cultural practices. Too few stories of resiliency and too few stories of communities asserting their, their authorities. Those stories existed. It's just they weren't sure, they weren't the dominant story. That is changing. Adichie warns us that power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. By wrapping one mask, Mike Willie changes that power relationship, changes that dominant story. When viewed together with Nicholson's artwork, they are actively pushing against one version of history. It's powerful, I think, powerful. Move to the next slide. I don't have Bill Reed's voice, but I'm going to read the excerpt. The great flood, which had covered the earth for so long, had at last receded, and the sand of roast spit, Haida Gwaii, lay dry. Raven walked along the sand, eyes and ears alert for an unusual sight or sound to break the monotony. A flash of white caught his eye and there, right at his feet, half buried in the sand, was a gigantic clamshell. He looked more closely and saw that the shell was full of little creatures cowering in terror in his enormous shadow. He leaned his great head close and with his smooth trickster tongue, coaxed and cajoled and coerced them to come out and play in his wonderful new shiny world. These dwellers were the original Hyas, the first humans. The text is an excerpt from the story, The Raven and the First Men, written by Bill Reed. The sculpture, amazing, The Raven and the First Men, also by Bill Reed, a masterwork of Haida art. Bill Reed is, was born in 1920 and died in 1998. He was a world-renowned artist who played a major role in revitalizing Northwest Coast arts and culture. His work and his influence continues to resonate through um, artists from the Northwest Coast. This sculpture is a great example of how different perspectives might shape the way you view your surroundings. The first men in the sculpture have different emotions in their gestures and facial features as they are being coaxed from the clamshell. Imagine their perspectives, seeing things for the first time, possibly as like one of the, the humans, upside down. Imagine what it would be like to be the first human on Haida Gwaii. This work also helps us look at the idea of multiple stories. This is a generalized Haida story. Not all Haida origin stories involve Raven, but all involve supernatural beings, most from the sea. We'll move to another slide. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a glass of water. The reality is that different Haida clans have different supernatural beings who bring or create the first humans, who bring forth or create the first humans. For example, through the potlatch system, the Haida clan, Skidigit Gidins, not Yoan's clan, reintroduced two finned wasco as the main identifying crest in a 2008 potlatch. Kilslai Wingan, Chief Sid Crosby, became chief, and this image is the button blanket with the two finned wasco that was part of his chiefly regalia. Wasco is a supernatural sea wolf who is featured in our origin story. I use the term our here because I was adopted into this clan at that potlatch in 2008 and given the name Jad. I needed to ask permission from our clan historian to share this story today, which adds to the complication of museum work. Not all knowledge is for sharing, some is owned and controlled. I was given permission because I am a clan member 
not because I'm an interested or trustworthy museum person. Like Mike Willie and Marianne Nicholson assert, authority over the story and its sharing is still in the control of the community. In this case, the clan. It's also a lesson in how one story can too easily become the only story. The story of the Raven and the First Men has become very popular in both books and images and artworks. However, its popularity has the potential to endanger learning and knowing about other Haida origin stories, such as the one of the Skidigit Gidins. There are more. I hear a Dutchie's warning here for us to resist the single narrative. We'll move on to the next slide. And I'll just take a second to look to see the questions. Oh, I will add this uh, from, oh, insider knowledge. Thank you, Carol Mayer, who's the, uh, uh, the head of curatorial and uh, senior curator at MOA. She adds, FYI, Teddy Balangu welcomed a new grandson during John's visit. The baby was named Noah after John's son. The two boys are viewed as brothers, as Teddy and John are. This event has linked the two families and now one of the stories told by both families. Thank you, Carol. Well, this is good. The next one is from Jolene Thomas. And she um, is from the Sepwet McNation. The next slide I'm going to talk about, we're nearing the end, is actually by a Sepwet uh, artist. I'm going to wrap up by using this artwork by Tanya Willard. Be a good girl. In order to reinforce understanding that stories are complex and multi-layered and to appreciate how art and artistic research can reframe historical narratives. Tanya Willard is of Setwatmuk and Settler Heritage. She is an artist, curator, and assistant professor in the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies at UBC Okanagan. She was the co-curator of a very um, popular and extraordinary exhibition called Unceded Territories, the work of Lawrence Paul Yocholapton. She created this work in 2013. Willard's research on residential schools taught her things she did not learn in school and that many still do not learn in school or beyond. Creating this artwork is one of the ways she directs attention to this important part of Canadian history. She states, residential school was a model of assimilation specifically designed to reduce indigenous people to a source of cheap labor. We'll move to a highlight. Uh, um, um, more detailed image of the work. There are many important visual symbolic elements in this piece. It is printed on gold paper, referencing the tradition in Western religions of precious art and objects found in churches. The central figure references religious traditions of, of depicting saints. Here though, the artist is doing more than that. She is showing that there was a mixing of traditions Western religions with indigenous spirituality. In the image, there are women working, sewing machines and ironing, and women praying. To the left and the right of the central figure, there are vultures flying. Hmm. Referencing the colonialism and Canadian policies, preying on indigenous peoples and cultures. This piece is really about that these schools were not about getting an excellent education. They were about training women for mostly domestic work and reinforcing assimilation through religion and prayer. After the Truth and, Reconcilia the Truth and Reconciliation Report and Call to Actions, these lesser known stories have begun to emerge more forcefully. We are moving in the right direction, embracing new stories, challenging ourselves to seek out new stories, different stories, diverse stories. They're more widely known. This does not mean that they weren't known to the people and the communities that experienced them. I think that's one of the roles the museum can play in finding ways to profile these really important stories and finding ways to share them so that people can engage. How are we doing for time? Pretty good. 
To conclude, I want to say I was inspired by Chimamanda Adachi's TED Talk 10, 10 years ago, and I continue to be inspired. It rang true for me that too many of the stories I relied upon were incomplete. The artworks I've highlighted helped me see new stories, to look deeper, to listen more. I hope they have done that for you. My last slide. I'm gonna end with two things. A recommendation for another great TED Talk by writer Siskon, Siskonke Mizimang. My apologies again for my pronunciations. If a story moves you, act upon it. She builds on uh, Aidaichi's dangers of a single story and really, really asks us to step up. And I give the last word to Aidaichi. Stories have been used to dispossess and malign, but stories can also be used to empower and humanize. Thank you. We can open up the comments and questions now, and I'm happy to respond to anything I can. Can you please put the link in the chat box? Oh, good idea. Haley, could you put the link to, uh, if a story moves you act upon it into the chat feature? That would be great. Oh, hi, Jill, this is Sylvia from the Edit and Med cohort from two years ago. <laughs> uh, she just said saying thank you. And that she uses the TED Talk frequently in her work. Thank you for saying that. There are other ways we could, there are, of course, it, I hope it goes without saying, but maybe I will say it, that there are many contemporary works in the museum's collections that we could have used to illustrate the idea of going deeper and listening more thoroughly and opening your eyes and minds and hearts to other views of the world and other stories. We just chose these ones. We could do this again and there could be a, a suite of other amazing artworks. Hi, Chika Jamie, I appreciate the thank you. Gila Kessler, Nicole, nice to have you here. Getting lots of thanks. Any comments, any questions? I appreciate the thanks. Well, here's a question. Do you have any recommendations for a curator of Arts of the Americas, past to present, who is situated in a less progressive institution? Well, first I'll take the compliment on behalf of MOA that uh, we're a progressive institution. I have to say, we all work really, really hard at it. Um, uh, we have a benefit for sure, being at MOA, uh, in some respects, closer to communities. Though it was interesting that Carol Mayer, uh, our senior curator, has participated today because the community she works with is not close. She works with the Pacific Islands. Um, so I think really reaching out and making relationships and trying to keep them is, is uh, maybe a trite but tried um, uh, way of doing it. And communities can also make noise. And so if community makes some noise about how they're represented and what, how they would like to see things differently, then maybe you can use that noise to advance your practice. Oh, okay. How's that, Michelle? I hope that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have an offline conversation, um, business to business, if you think there's some things we can learn from each other. Jamie asks, can you talk about the doors really quickly? My uncle was one of the carvers, Vern Stevens. Oh, what a thrill. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, she's talking about the Kassan doors. They, um, when the museum first opened in 1976, they were outside and were opened and there's a way for you to come through. They're now in the lobby. They're amazing carved cedar works out of Kassan, which was a really important um, art school uh, in the north. It's, it's, new, it's not a new life, but um, taking on from that role is the Frida Dysing School. Um, of uh, First Nations art that's at the Coast Mountain College now. They're picking up the work that was started in the 70s um, by the Kassan School. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I can help you with, Jamie, except for to tell you that it's amazing and that it tells some stories. 
tells the stories of a, a, a Gik Sand story that we're not actually privileged to share. Um, but if you want to send a quick note uh, by email, I can connect you with the curator at MOA who can give you a bit more in information about the work. So then we have Samantha. Thank you. Moved and inspired. Good. A UBC student who studies food justice and storytelling. Awesome. I'd love to hear more. Uh, so what does she say? UBC's lived experiences with food. What advice do you have for young storytellers who would like to present nuanced and diverse accounts of lived experience so that social justice outcomes can be achieved? Well, I don't know, is it so ridiculous to say that maybe <laughs> have uh, some of these TED Talks on, have them on redial and listen to the words and the language that they use? Both of these uh, writers, um, are extraordinary in terms of the way they're able to use language that helps evoke a depth. And, um, uh, but I, I don't know, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. Nuance is, is challenging, but uh, diversifying your uh, group and the people who you work with is one way to have that nuance um, brought to the fore because the more people you work with, the more voices you have, the more differences you get to have to wrestle with and the better off I think we all are as, as, an, as a result. Again, uh, you can uh, email me personally and see if there's some things that uh, we do in terms of how we engage with our visitors, how we engage with schools and how we even train volunteers that might be useful to you to see how you try to get this embedded in people's perspectives. Thanks, Samantha. Sandy Dockstetter. Hello, lovely to hear you or see you or what am I reading you? Uh, and she asks, uh, do you have any artists and authors from the 60s scoop or that were in foster care? Oh, I would recommend Anthony Melting Tallow. Thank you, I don't know Anthony Melting Tallow. Uh, look him up when we're done here. Um, I would have to say that I, I don't know all of the deep personal histories of some of the artists that are in our collection and whether or not they were uh, adopted out, which is referenced if for people who don't know when you use the term 60 scoop. It's a reference to how many Indigenous children were removed from their families and their communities and adopted to non-Indigenous families or whether they were in foster care. So it's an interesting question whether or not artists put that in their bios or if that's information that they want to share. Thanks, Sandy, but I'm going to be looking up Anthony Melting Tallow. Next, we have Daniel. Oh, a virtual tour. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> um, there's a few of us who are on this chat today who are working to develop a multimedia guide and virtual tours on our top of mind. There is a couple of things you can do now. If you go onto MOA's website, uh, you can look at the exhibition Shake Up preserving what we value. And there is a virtual tour of the MOA's Great Hall currently there. Um, and we're hoping to get that uh, in a format that's a little easier to read and be accessible. And a note to everybody who's listening, um, the museum's uh, collections are online. So we call it the MOA Cat catalog online. And uh, you can look up all images. Many of them are high resolution images of the museum's collection. Where there aren't images, it's because we don't have the copyright or they're culturally sensitive, but there are tens of thousands of images of museums collections in there. And you'll also sometimes find short videos of artists um, and other um, features in the MOA, MOA Cat online. Thanks, Daniel. Now we have a question from Evan. How does MOA actively promote consent for featuring, featuring archeological apps artifacts of a multiple multitude of different First Nations? Hmm. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, Evan, except for that um, uh, most of the archaeological collections that are in the Museum of Anthropology are actually part of the Laboratory of Archaeology, the Department of Anthropology's collection, which are held in trust for the province of BC. So there's a separation. The Laboratory of Archaeology is a different institution. And they have amazing relationships with many, many indigenous communities in the province. Um, and so 
that would be probably a question if you if you wanted it more thoroughly answered. Again, you could send it to me and I would forward you to the Laboratory of Archaeology. Thanks, Evan. Sue, hello, Sue Donaldson. Um, nice, to, uh, nice that you're here. With a few public museums about to open, for example, uh, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, is there any reopening date for MOA? Well, yes, we're hoping very soon, actually, with maybe by the end of June. We don't have a fixed date, and we have, as with everyone else, have a lot of behind the scenes work to do to make sure that we're caring for the safety of the staff and the visitors and making sure we have protocols in place for social distancing. So behind the scenes at MOA, there's a committee working very hard on that now, and we hope to be able to uh, meet all the criteria and uh, provide all the safety and personal um, um, protection equipment uh, needed. But at this moment, we're optimistic that hopefully by the end of June. Thanks, Sue. Um, this is an anonymous attendee. What seems to be missing is how the settlers displaced the indigenous people. What happened and how did it happen and why is this missing? Well, that's a good question. I guess it, it depends on where you're talking about. Across the province, it happened in various different ways. We don't really speak to how did it happen in terms of how the city of Vancouver, for example, became such a megalopolis. Um, but we do reference the, how settlers displaced the indigenous peoples by using terms like unseated, by acknowledging that the museum is actually on Musqueam territory. But you're right, it's a, it's a longer history about how, how this transpired. So I'm, I'm not sure I would agree that it's missing in terms of the history of the, for example, the, uh, the history of the development of the Lower Mainland. It is in various museums, uh, you know, storylines. But instead, I think our perspective is we've tried to switch it to say, how can we foreground what the community has to say rather than the history of displacement? But that's a good question. I'll move on. How are we doing for time? Got a few more minutes. Um, oh, Catriona, are we looking for volunteers and how do we get involved? Great question. Stay tuned. Um, we always post it on our website when we're recruiting volunteers, but because the museum is currently closed, um, we are not going to be recruiting volunteers as we normally do in May and June of this year, and we'll be moving it to the fall. So check the website occasionally and you should see a notice when we're recruiting volunteers. Another anonymous attendee, work in a public library. Is there a more recommended list of titles that would be respectful to share in a general public? Huh. Well, thanks for the um, notes on the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, that would be really great. We probably all, if we asked internally, everybody top 10 list of things to read and, uh, and that would be a great thing to compile. Maybe push back at another time, send an email and uh, we can um, send it around internally for people to add to their list. Oh, is there a way to make Jill bigger? <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm already a big woman. <laughs> I think that's a, a lesson to the tech side of things or a, a note to the test side. Uh, Rosalind, thank you for your comments. I, I look forward to having you visit MOA too. Okay, uh, somebody's question is missing. The MOV has a good display on the settlers and indigenous histories. Thank you for reminding, yes. Um, there's an exhibition at the Museum of Vancouver called Sasnam, the city before the city. It was a co, uh, it was a collaborative production between the Museum of Anthropology, Musqueam First Nations and the Museum of uh, Vancouver. And it's on display there and it goes through an amazing history. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the reminder, of course, Sasnam. Um, and it uses the collections from the Museum of Vancouver and the knowledge and the consent to use that knowledge from the community of Musqueam. It's a really important exhibit and I encourage you all to see it. Thank you for the reminder there. Would you expand your thoughts about the difference between engaging with the arts in person versus digital? Yeah, I guess it's maybe not a thought as much as it's um, sort of, it would be 
I would I wouldn't have any problem engaging with arts um, that were generated digitally in a digital environment. But some of these things, they're three dimensional. You need to walk around. You need to be able to look closer and further away. Things that this Zoom technology, at least my limited ability to use it, can't do. So that was my only comment was that uh, it's good to see the thing. But if you can't see the thing, high resolution images and these 3D virtual tours that many museums are creating is a good way to provide some access. Because as public institutions, we do have to think about how we, how we are inclusive and accessible. Thanks for that. Corey, any, uh, lots of, any thoughts on showcasing the relationship of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh in some way? Wouldn't that be great? I do, I, I can tell you that in an exhibition that was co-curated by uh, seven different curators, five from First Nations communities and uh, museums and cultural centers, and two of us from MOA called Culture at the Center, we did profile the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh agreement as a way uh, to represent that there is collaboration between these communities. Um, so we, we showed the agreement and we talked a little bit about how that agreement uh, was historic in that it sort of stepped away from all the legal mumbo jumbo, maybe that's not fair, um, and got the communities into a room and said, how can we work with each other and uh, move forward uh, productively? But yes, that's more of a history of the lower mainland, isn't it? Uh, overlapping. I, I guess I should say, for people who aren't familiar with British Columbia or the Vancouver area, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam are three of the uh, communities who um, live in what we uh, now refer to as the Lower Mainland and have lived here for 10,000 years or more. Okay, thank you, Corey. Just before you close, could you quickly run through the beautiful pieces again? I can actually ask, that would be great. Would you just do that? Uh, Haley, just flip through the slides so people can see the artwork. That's a great idea. Thank you, Elizabeth. And this is from Anne. One of my grade 12 English studies students recently observed that her story, both First Nations and a believing Christian, was lacking from the novels. I'll just say, uh, it's jumping around. Was lacking from the novels by First Nations authors in the classroom. She was right. Many novels included Indigenous characters rejecting Christianity and embracing traditional beliefs. As she put it, that's not what I believe. Well, maybe, uh, maybe your student is going to be one of those authors. Um, it's not maybe not a bad place to end, but um, because she doesn't see it, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So I'm sorry that I can't provide her with a couple of examples, um, but maybe she will be the next Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and she will write those stories um, so that the complexity and the beauty of the multiple storied universe continues. Thank you, Anne, for your comment. I think we're like running down to the last few seconds. So I will end, if you can't see me, I'm raising my hands as a gesture of thanks for your participation in this. And I want a really special thanks to Bonnie, Sun, Haley, Ma, and Caroline Casanelli, who have helped me tremendously to put this online. Stay well, and no, uh, maybe I will end with the words of Bonnie, our, our, our friend, uh, Dr. Bonnie, uh, be kind, Stay safe, stay well. I think I got it wrong. Anyways, thank you everyone.